So thank you all for uh, coming to the uh, 14th CHEP seminar of the year. Um, I might take these. I'm really grateful uh, this week to have a good friend, uh, Karen Conway, here to uh, join us this week. Uh, Karen is the John A. Hogan Pro Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, she's trained as a labor economist, but has done a heck of a lot of work also in, in public finance and economic demography, has published in uh, top field journals and top general journals uh, in economics. Um, and I'm really excited to have you here today. Uh, Karen's going to present on uh, income tax breaks for the old and, yes. uh, and economic growth. Thanks so much right. for being here. Well, thank you so much, Joe. I, I definitely got the best end of the deal here. This is amazing to be in San Diego versus like New Hampshire in February. I mean, this is this is great. So, no, I, I'm really happy to get to present this to you. Um, again, I am also do a lot of health, so I'm happy to talk with people about that too. Um, and this is kind of the confluence of the two because the that there's a lot of undercurrents of that here. So this is work that we're in the process of revising. So comments would be wonderful. So please, you know, give me your questions, give me your comments. If you think of something later, shoot me an email. I'd really appreciate it. So this is co-authored work with Ben Brewer, who's a former PhD student of mine, and John Rourke, who we've been working together for a lot of years on the elderly. And the problem with this presentation is I've got way too much stuff because I want to give you, I want to tell you everything I ever did. And so I probably want to give you too much background, but Let's get started. So why would you care about tax breaks for the elderly? I think most people don't even know that there are serious income tax breaks for the elderly. I didn't until I started doing this research. But actually, they're really widespread. It's like 24 out of 34 OECD countries offer breaks. The federal income tax and every state with an income tax offers income tax breaks for the elderly. And on average, an elderly household pays about two-thirds of the income tax as an equivalent non-elderly household. So same income level, same number of people. And that's actually also the same worldwide. It's, it's not just the states. It happens to be true of the states, but this is a pretty common theme that they pay about two-thirds. So they operate through a number of ways. I'm going to try to go through that quickly. Um, deductions, exemptions, and then especially the favorable tax treatment of certain types of income. Has, mm -hmm. has, it, has this always been the case, or is this a relatively recent phenomenon, historically? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, I actually have a history, we dug into the history because I wanted to know, I wanted the smoking gun. I wanted to know how it started. And it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, the exemptions are old, they come from the 50s. And the treatment of Social Security benefits was a federal accident, actually. The IRS decided that rule, actually. But pension income, which is the big one, is a relatively new. And that's where all the action is. So, and not all, but that's where a lot of it is. So yeah, it's yes and no. A lot of some of it's been around, but it's growing, and it's a real policy in flux, which is why, of course, it's been interesting for me to study. So again, kind of answer this: these tax breaks have grown, and they're continuing to grow at the state level. I have a, in a few minutes. I'll tell you, it's not completely growing. There have been a few states that have ratcheted back, but the big movement has been to grow. Excuse me, are they mm -hmm. growing because of the larger proportion of elderly or because they changed the policies? Uh, because they changed the policies, yes. Yeah, in all of these cases I'm focusing on you know, just the policy, but the impacts. <laughs> Bingo, my third point. Yes, so the policies have become more generous and as we know the elderly are both growing and they're growing richer. And so the costs of these tax breaks are growing and are going to grow just more into the future. So we think this is a little known policy that it could actually have really big implications. Um, so what are the reasons for giving these tax breaks? And this is where my historical journey, reading old newspapers from the 30s and 40s was really fun, and 50s. A recurring theme is this equity view. The elderly are needy. They're a needy population, they're vulnerable, you know, we don't want grandma eating dog food kind of argument. And here's a great quote from New Jersey, right? Too many people in New Jersey face retirement with insecure incomes. Too many retirees find it hard to make ends meet. But look at the policy. He's talking about increasing the exemption from $20,000 to $100,000. That's way beyond eating dog food from a can. I mean, even in New Jersey, New Jersey's expensive, but still, that's, that's reaching really, as we'll see, really far up into the income distribution. And that bill passed, okay? Um, 
economic growth, I'm going to argue implicitly in their arguments. I'll show, I have too many quotes. I'll try to skip through some of them. But the idea here is that you know, the lower taxes will encourage these rich elderly to move into their state. Or in cases like New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, keep them from moving. The big worry is that all these rich people are moving to Florida to golf or South Carolina. Let's keep them here. And so here's another quote. These seniors are taking their pensions and fleeing to Florida. Other states that do not tax, and other states that do not tax it. We want them to keep their, pay their taxes here. And this was another one. So here was New York wanting to double the pension exemption to $40,000 at an annual cost of $275 million, which, you know, it's not peanuts. I mean, it's not billions, but it's still not peanuts. And again, that bill passed too. And these are very recent. These are both 2016, 2017. Um, and then this one, I just like, this one was just a little confused. She like throws them both together. So Connecticut's trying to exempt all Social Security income and all pension income from taxes. They've been pushing on that for a couple of years. And the estate tax. They also want to get rid of the estate tax. So I have to throw this up here. There's some well-known folks here who promoted this. Sonny Perdue, when he was the governor of Georgia. Georgia was a early mover on this one. They, for a while there, they were exempting like $130,000 in, in pension income, something like that. Our, uh, our, my next door neighbor, Governor Paula Page, has also been pushing it for years. Um, so again, some sort of notable um, national figures. Um, so we have tried to tear apart these two arguments in past work. The equity argument just does not find. I mean, you can see that when you think of going from twenty to $100,000. But the very low income elderly don't pay any income taxes. So these breaks, unless they're refundable, unless the credit is refundable where you actually get money back from the government, they'll pay you a check, their liabilities are zero. So these policies are not helping the low income elderly. And there are, there are very, there are poor elderly, don't get me wrong. They're just not getting any kind of benefit from these policies. Um, so let's turn to the second argument. I'll, I'll give you, if I have time, I'll give you some hard facts on the first one. But I, I barely got through half my presentation <laughs> last time I gave it. So um, in the second argument, implicit in this is that keeping the elderly taxpayers is good for the state. And you know, I, to me, that is a questionable argument. Why inherently would keeping these taxpayers be good? But it also presumes that elderly migration is affected by taxes, that people are actually are fleeing to Florida to avoid paying taxes, or are going to be attracted or convinced to stay in New Jersey if they lower the tax. And there, there's actually very little evidence to support that. Um, John and I have, this is one study, we've done a number of studies, and we just really don't find very much. Um, and if you're interested in this and you don't want to slog through a bunch of papers, I do have a, a recent policy brief I did for the Carsey um, policy school that summarizes all these points and it's very easy to read and so if you're interested in this you can check that out it came out last year so as we were thinking about this we realized the real question is whether these tax breaks are good for growth we've been studying the mechanism migration but the real question is is it good for the state um, because as I'll talk about in a little bit migration is actually really hard to measure and there could be other effects that affect growth so that's why we decided to do this study. And Ben was actually a growth guy. I'm not a growth person. He's also a time series guy. I'm not a time series woman. Um, and then John and I have been doing this. So it was a great partnership. It was a natural partnership for the three of us to tackle this. OK, so I have to throw this out here. Um, just last month, I, where do these people get these? Yancey McGill, I love this name, gubernatorial candidate in South Carolina. Let's see if I can do this. I can scroll down, look at him with all of his people there. His platform, he wrote this big op-ed saying how, I can't remember, if, I think the title was there. Ah, South Carolina's golden opportunity. He's talking about eliminating all taxes, on, completely eliminate income taxes on South Carolina residents who have reached the age of 65. Completely eliminate. And this guy's kind of done his homework. These are all the reasons why he thinks it's going to improve growth. I was like, did you read our paper? How did you, I mean, we don't actually spell this out, but you know, he has a number of things in here. They, they're going to move here. Um, the economic growth from all the new seniors migrating here will swell the coffers of state and local government. So there's revenues. They will have zero impact on certain government services, such as schools. Okay. 
Um, and you just, it, it goes on and on. Um, they have significant wealth that they bring with them, swelling South Carolina investment businesses, such as banks, financial institutions, etc. So, and it, it goes on, I couldn't believe it, it was like finding the, the Holy Grail last month. I said, we'd already written the paper, but it was like, wow, they're actually talking about this. Oh, now I go back here. And I point this out because when I have talked about this to people in the past, it's like, well, why would anybody think this is good for growth? That's what economists say to me. Why would it be good for growth? So I show you, well, policy people think it's good for growth, and they have their arguments in line. So um, just again, this is just to point out to you that it is a real policy influx in answer to your question, Joe. At least 13 states. I want to give a plug to Google Alerts. How many of you have ever used Google Alerts? It's, if you're studying a policy or studying a question, sign up for Google Alerts. Um, because I get, I get too much in my inbox every day. But this is how I keep track of what's going on at the state level. It'll tell me, you know, everybody who's proposing a bill, bill passes, what have you. And I'm actually so far behind, I have my research assistant digging through. I mean, I was doing it myself for a while. I was like, this is crazy. I've got to get someone to help me with this. Um, I'm a little bit behind, but at last count, there were 13 states in 2017 alone, by, since the beginning of 2017, um, that had proposed an expansion of it. Um, there are some who have retracted. Michigan, famously, Rick Snyder, I think that's the right thing. He's been taking, he's taken a lot of heat because he started taxing not existing retirees, but sort of as people hit retirement, they started getting taxed more heavily. And North Carolina and Georgia have both backpedaled a little bit. And Kentucky keeps talking about it. To save $485 million. I mean, that's a lot of money. On what, on what margins have they reduced the, the tax rates? Typically the pension exemption. So Georgia was like giving away the farm. I mean, they were $130,000, I think, per, per, might have been per household, but that's a lot. And Michigan had a really hefty, it was like $80,000. And so they were ratcheting it back. Sometimes phasing it out at higher incomes, reducing the level. Illinois and Hawaii are interesting because they both completely exempt certain types of pension income. Illinois actually exempts all types of income, and Hawaii does defined benefit. And so they have talked about getting rid of that. I mean, Illinois, if you read the papers, Illinois is in tough shape. And so this keeps getting kicked around. So what do we do? Um, this is the background of the talk, if I get to it all. So I at least want to give you the highlights here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the tax breaks so you understand how they work. Um, I'm probably going to gloss over two a little bit because that's where I got, I've gotten bogged down. I'm just going to tell you that there are plausible reasons to think it could affect growth and that we don't really know. It's arbitrary. It could go either way. So again, one of those questions, don't know, could go up, could go down, could have no effect. I personally thought it would have no effect when I started this project. I thought it's not going to have an impact. Um, and then we do two different empirical analyses, which I think I want to highlight this here just in case it gets lost later. What I really like about this approach is we're using really different sources of variation. Neither one of them is perfect. They both have their problems. You could throw darts at both of them. But they're different darts, and they're different shortcomings. And so it's, it's a really nice complement. So the one is one you're probably more familiar with. You know, we're looking at change in state policy over time. You know, basically sort of a diff and diff with you know, fixed effects. It's not really diff and diff, but you've got the fixed effects, and um, you're using panel analysis. The other is a growing um, method I've been seeing where you look at how fat changes in federal policy manifest themselves differently at the state level. And I don't love that either. I mean, this one you could say suffers from endogeneity. You know, a state enacts this policy like Connecticut because it's hurting. That's why they do it. So cause and effect gets messed up. Um, I get that. The problem with this one is, you know, so the impact depends on the demographics of your state. And it seems like that's going to have an independent effect too. So I'm not, I'm not totally convinced that either one's perfect, but I think the sum of the parts. It's initial, right? It's, an, it's initial characteristics of states at the time of the federal change. Exactly. But like in our case, older states are going to get more of the benefit. Wouldn't they maybe grow differently? Do you know what I mean? So I, I'm not totally convinced there. I mean, I think they both have their strengths and weaknesses. So we use a lot, a couple different data sets, a couple of different approaches. And actually, that's been the challenge of this paper. So we're probably trying to do too much. So, And then hopefully I'll have time to conclude. I'll make sure. I go to 3. 3.15, okay. So I'm doing pretty well. All right, any questions so far? Okay. So quick background on these breaks. Again, they're basically three types. I am only talking about breaks to the existing elderly. 
not talking about the benefits you get you know, by sticking something in your IRA. So the first one is an extra deduction exemption credit on the basis of age. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you filled out your tax returns, it's that extra box if you're blind or over age 65. And they're usually pretty modest. And in answer to your question, Joe, um, they started in the 1950s. The first federal policy was right around 48, 49, and then the states kind of just picked it up. Um, they all reduced with the Tax Reform Act of 1986. They, they follow, a lot of them followed the federal government. But in general, they've been pretty stable over time. And you can see that most states, you know, three quarters of the states that have income taxes have one. Um, the next one, so that's the most modest of them. The next one is the treatment of Social Security benefits. So Social Security benefits were entirely tax exempt, federal, state level, until 1983. And as I mentioned, it was actually an accident. When they enacted Social Security, they didn't talk about whether it should be taxable or not. And the IRS, actually, I had to dig in. I finally discovered the IRS made the ruling in like 1943, which made it tax exempt. And then in 1983, to try to shore up the Social Security system, they began taxing the Social Security benefits of high income taxpayers. 25,000 for a single and 32,000 for married. And it's a little bit of a complicated formula, but it's basically your taxable income with a little bit of your Social Security benefits thrown in to get to those thresholds. Those thresholds haven't been adjusted, by the way. Um, there's been a movement at the federal level to increase them. So more and more people are paying this. In 1983, not many people paid this. Now, a lot of retirees are facing this. In 1993, um, the federal government added a second set of thresholds. And if you guys are into budget constraints, this is a, a fun little paper we mapped this thing out. Um, you hit this threshold, you start paid 85% on 85% of your Social Security benefits. But for a really short range, it's like a really steep bite, and then it, then it goes away. Um, and so you could pay, if you, you know, make the huge amount of money of $44,000 as a married couple, you could pay taxes on 85%. On okay. Now the states have been mixed here. The majority have not followed the federal government. And the ones that have, they kind of jostle around. This is one of the ones that gets discussed and debated and gets removed. Like Wisconsin got rid of it, Missouri got rid of it, a few others in the you know, mid-2000s. Um, so this has moved around. It, it's low. It's, this is probably the lowest it's ever been. So 10 follow the U.S. law. Actually, Vermont is now talking about no longer taxing Social Security benefits. They're, they're on the list. Um, Connecticut, you've already saw that. Um, and then four more tax at a lower, at a more generous level. So the vast majority of states have no tax on Social Security benefits. So that's a lot. I mean, that's where most of the elderly get their money from. And, you know, a lot of this income hasn't really been taxed yet. So it is kind of free money on the table. This is the big kahuna, though. Um, the partial or full exemption of pension income. And how they define pension income varies widely. Like Georgia, it's anything except limited to $4,000 in earned income. But, you know, it's interest, dividends, rents, you know anything, as long as you don't work for it, <laughs> as long as you don't work for more than 4,000 of it, would count as you know, retirement or pension income. Some states, it's got to be defined benefit. You know, it's got to be a real specific kind of income. So there is some variation there. But this is completely unique to the states. Federal does not. Pension income is taxable, taxable. Um, and as I was mentioning, when you were asking what, what margin, some states phase it out at high levels of income. So like Minnesota has done that. It tends to, to phase it out. This is where you see all the growth. So 14 states had some exemption in 1997. 31 did in 2015. So it's grown a lot, and it's grown in number a lot, too. Has the AARP much to do with it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting. They actually, <laughs> this is OK on video day. Um, they actually invited me a few years ago to one of the things. I'm like, are you sure you want me <laughs> to come and talk? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was actually very interested. The national AARP was very supportive of this research. Said we don't want any sort of discrimination on the basis of age, taxes or anything. You know, we want it on the basis of need. So I, the, the national AARP is not, but the state, a, the state offices really get involved. They're right there as soon as they start to try to take it away. I don't know how much they advocate for more, 
But those states I had pointed out where they started chipping away, they're right there lobbying heavily. So I would say definitely at the state level. The national level, I was, you know, kind of, it was interesting to talk with them about it. They were a little more circumspect. But yeah, no, they're definitely a force, <laughs> for sure. Actually, I'll tell you, so when we originally started this paper, I had pitched it as, okay, we'll do this really small paper on growth, and the second half will be on elections, because I, I think it's political. So now I'll have to do that as another paper. But I'd love to look at that to see if this is actually all about getting elected. Um, but that's going to have to wait for another paper, because this is already probably too much for one paper. So the other thing I have to point out is that these three policies interact with each other. So sometimes Social Security benefits is included in the pension income. It's included in that level. So if it's $40,000, that includes all your Social Security benefits. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, again, sometimes they phase out. Some states like West Virginia you know, have, you know, it, or I think it's West Virginia, have an or. You can either take a really big exemption or you can exempt a certain amount of your pension. So you can't kind of take them in pieces. So we devise a measure that, you know, combines them all. So let me just give you a couple of stats. This is actually from my policy brief, I believe. Um, this is just the pensions. So, you know, the red is 2013 and then the blue is 1990. The legend's a little small. So this is the number of states and the sizes. So you can see in um, 1990, you know, there were a lot of states that were not exempt, and it's, you know, it's just moved this direction. And so now we're at five states that fully exempt pension income. And this category is between twenty dollars and $100,000. So, and this is before New York and New Jersey. This is going to get even bigger now with New York and New Jersey. So again, it's been a real movement. Um, that we've seen in this. So I looked up this morning, I'm like, I don't know what California does. It's not one I hear about very often. I think it's all around me in New Hampshire. It's like Connecticut, Vermont, Maine, you know, it's all around me. So I thought, well, let me find out what California, so I got on, Googled, and found out what California does. Because um, again, I, you know, we're using tax sim, so I sometimes forget the specifics. So I would say it's a middle of the road state. It's pretty middle of the road, and actually our maps show that. It's pretty middle of the road. Um, all Social Security benefits is exempt. You get an exemption tax credit, so credit means you get the money back, dollar for dollar, um, of 111 or $222. It's actually out of the state income taxes, usually, especially for modest income, they usually aren't all that big, so that's not nothing. And then they have the senior head of household credit, which is worth as much as $1,300, um, oh, worth, yeah, 2% of taxable income up to $1,300. So again, this kind of puts it middle of the road. Um, so, just thought, in case you were curious, that's what California does. Okay, so I, had, I made the point that it really doesn't help the low income. This slide shows you this. So that's the bottom 25%. This is another a past paper that we did. This just shows you how very little they're paying in taxes. So this top one is saying, on average, the estimated state tax liability for the lowest 25% is a minus 10. So they're getting some kind of credit from the state. Okay, so I mean these breaks aren't going to help them. And the benefit, the second line is what's the benefit to you? Because what would happen to your liability if you weren't old? So it would go up $130. So we're not talking about very much. Um, over here we have the median and the top 10% and you can see it starts to become pretty big money. $5,000 in Georgia? That's pretty big money. Right? Even for the top 10%, it's pretty big money. And again, their incomes are talking about 129,000. So you know, they're not, we're not talking millionaires either. So 5,000 is you know, a pretty decent amount of money. Or the six, $1,700 out of 37,000. It's a pretty sizable chunk. So again, it's these groups that are really benefiting. So I'm kind of just making these points again. Low income households are not benefiting. We actually found in another paper that they're actually hurt because they don't get the EITC. So if they're working at Walmart, they turn 65, they lose the ITC. So if we actually really wanted to help the lowest income, we might think about you know, expanding the ITC. It's the middle and higher income households that benefit the most. And it's actually kind of that middle high. Because this, just, just to give you a snapshot, this is what elderly income households look like. So the blue is Social Security. So you can see you know, the, the lowest is getting almost all their money from Social Security. The, the higher income, they're the ones who have quite a bit of pension income. They also have some, this is the pension, and then they also have some wages. The really, really 
rich, you know, obviously get theirs from dividends and stuff. So this just kind of gives you an idea of why that low group, you know, really, it's also really low. It's $18,000. I mean, it's low. You're not going to pay much in taxes. Okay, so any questions on how these taxes work? Good, good. Okay. So I'll go through this fairly quickly, but again, I, we've bolstered this part of the paper a lot because every time, you know, we would present it or show it to someone, they're like, well, how can it affect growth? I want to understand how this could affect growth. Um, and so, and I'm not a growth theorist. First person to say this. My first growth paper. Um, probably will do at least one more, but I'm not a growth person. As I understand it, so there are both short run and long run effects. So short run, if you think about a curve, you know it's a bump, and then it goes on. You know, long runs when you know it actually shifts the slope and it keeps on, you know, keeps on growing. Long run effects, it keeps on changing the rate of growth. Um, and so the short run effect could be both demand or supply side, right? You could get a real shot in the arm of the economy and bump up growth, especially if you're not at full employment. In the long run, you really need, right, if we think back to our production possibility frontier, you really need more resources and you need those resources to be growing for growth, for there to be an increase in growth. So the economy has to be getting bigger, there's got to be something going on with technology um, or entrepreneurship. And so, and it's this long run effects, I think, that throw people. It's like, how could recruiting the elderly be good for long run growth? Yes? So I thought you were going to downplay the migration and talk about the distortionary tax effects. Um, yeah, I, I will talk a little how bit about them. Explain how, how it would affect the. The distortionary? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, let, give me, let me give a couple more slides and I will get to that. I will sp explain it then. And I would welcome it because I'm looking for arguments. I mean, I don't want to rely on Yancey, you know, completely. So um, I do want to point out there is one complication in this literature. There's a large literature that looks at the effect of taxes on growth. No one's looked at this policy, but there's a lot that's looked at taxation. And the real issue is, well, states live in countries sometimes, live in a world of balanced budgets. So if you've got high taxes, well, what's that providing? So there's a balanced budget effect. And that's something this literature really grapples with, is, well, what's the other side of the equation? And for now, when I talk about these effects, I'm only going to talk about the direct effect or the partial effect. But in the empirical analysis, we play around with this by, by controlling for different parts of the, the, um, the rest of the government. OK, so I will, I'll talk about migration first quickly and then, although it does play someone in the distortionary. So again, as those quotes from the policymakers suggested, this is what they really play up. That, you know, we're going to keep these people, or we're going to recruit these people, it's the golden opportunity. And it's gonna, they tend to focus on the demand side stimulus, you know, they're going to bring their income with them. Um, but Yancey, I liked him because he did talk about you know, the other things it might bring in, you know, the sort of capital, the knowledge, all of that. Actually, um, LePage made that point too. And there have been some work, there's some very recent work by Nicole um, Mastis and company looking at the age of the population and what that does for growth. The idea that their labor force participation elasticities are different. Um, and that their labor productivity may be different, and there may be spillovers, knowledge spillovers, either good or bad. You know, maybe having older workers in the workforce make the young more productive, maybe it makes them less productive. Um, they actually find it's not good for growth um, in their work, whereas another one finds that there's no effect. So again, this is the whole idea that migration will change both the size and the age composition of your state. And that could have both sort of demand, short run effects, and it could have long run effects if it changes your stock of labor and capital and other things. Wouldn't it be, I mean, you may have that, but wouldn't it be the, the place here on the demand side to also mention all the costs that these elderly can bring with them in terms of extra health costs? Right, exactly. Although, um, you know, they get, most of them would be getting Medicare, which would be a federally Funded. Some of them might have Medicaid, but the low-income elderly don't generally move as much as the higher income do, and that's what they're—that's why they're focusing on them. They say the equity argument, but we saw the breaks are for the high income, um, and so you know. But I have wondered that same thing, and that's why I, you know I'm like I don't see why these people are going to be good. I mean, most most healthcare systems don't need a boost, right? They're already 
you know, they're already at capacity and that's not necessarily the growth industry you want. Um, but I think the goal of these states is to get them when they're healthy. Uh, and I was actually just, just, just talking earlier about this boomerang idea where you can recruit the elderly to come down and play golf and eat in your restaurants and, you know, go move to Florida and then once they get sick, they go back home <laughs> to their children. They go back to New York, they hit the Medicaid system there. So in a way, this could be a very savvy policy because we do see that phenomenon. We see people moving and then moving back. Um, but I agree with you. To me, it's not clear that they're necessarily a positive thing. Um, but it's possible, right? It could be, and it could be bad. That, that's, that's the great thing about this paper. It didn't matter what we found. We could tell a story either way because it, it made sense. Um, so I just want to point out here again that the evidence for migration is actually very weak. So the distortionary taxes is probably the more important story. We find very little effect on migration. And even if we did, and I've done some back of the envelope calculations, it's pretty rare. The elderly really don't move that much. It's less than 1% a year move across state lines. You know, so this isn't huge en masse migration. It's actually pretty rare. But, and I do need to say I have a big but here. Um, it's really hard to observe the wealthy. I mean, like when I actually talk to people in Connecticut, they're worried about like one multimillionaire moving out. You know, one guy who's, you know, paying millions, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes moving out. So maybe an issue with small numbers. And we're not, I'm not going to observe that in census data. I'm not going to observe those one or two really high rollers. So I have to acknowledge that. There is a possibility that a few influential people it affects and that could have a big impact. Sort of at what point in time you're sort of looking at the, I mean, I could imagine sort of decisions, you know, maybe sort of a change in policy. If, is there more of this migration presumably going on at the point of retirement, right? Yes. So sort of th th thinking about what the policy set looks like across states as, or what their ex the expected set of policy options across states are as they approach sort of that time of retirement. Right. It seems like... It, the important time to be thinking about migration decisions when, when I'd imagine most people are, are making decisions about where they're going to retire to. So, so where in, in the previous work you're talking about on, on mm -hmm. migration, where what what margins, what times are you sort of looking at? So we again the the challenge with studying migration is that it is rare. Yeah. And so you look at a, like a longitudinal data set like the HRS and you're looking at 90 people or something. You know, it's so small. So we're sort of forced to look at these big census data sets if we want to get a reasonable size. So we have cut it in a number of ways. Like we cut it top quartile. Um, we cut it 65 or, you know, 50 to 60, you know, 60 to that young elderly, 60 to 69. And we just really didn't find anything. That was exactly what we thought. Well, if we just zeroed in. But again, you know, we can't zero in on those millionaires very easily. Hopefully we will. We're, we're now working on a new project where we might be able to get that kind of information. But that's been my hesitation is I, I can't tell you that how millionaires are behaving because I don't have that data. Um, to what degree is the migration influenced by the state rule about what proportion of the time Mm. The president needs to be residing there, and does that vary across states? Like, I know a lady from Arizona who makes sure she spends 50% of her time in Arizona to, so she doesn't pay income tax. But any time beyond that, she comes to California. Right. And so I wonder whether that's, that's for, whether all states require that people spend at least half their time in the state. My, so my impression, and I've got two answers for you, I, I don't want to say for certain. My impression is that it is pretty much the standard over six month rule. And it seems like it would almost have to be uniform because otherwise states would, you know, they'd bump into each other. No, he's resident here. No, he's resident there. That's, that's just my, and, and that's been my impression. You have to spend at least six, half, more than half the year, one day over half the year. So I'm almost certain that's the case. I don't want to say 100%. But your point is exactly why another motivation for why I think looking at growth may be a more direct answer. Because if that woman is staying one more day because of the tax, is it really going to have that big of an impact? Right? Yeah, she'll pay her taxes there, but she's not spending more. She's not, you know what I mean? So I think that's a, you know, a great sales pitch for why maybe we should look at growth, that migration is not going to really capture it. 
So no, that's a really good point. And I, you know, you make me. I really should look at that because if there is a difference, that's a margin we should look at. But I think there is. I think I've read about you think there is. I'll have to check. Um, because my impression was it was the same, but you know, if it's different, that'd be a great source of variation. <laughs> Got to get right on that. So that'd be great. Okay. Um, so to the distortionary tax. So again, we're kind of dismissing migration, but maybe you know, maybe it's the millionaires. Um, you know, maybe it's things are going on that we can't observe. Um, but they do, it's a distortionary tax, right? The income tax is a distortionary tax. It's a tax on your labor income. It's a tax on your interest income. It could affect your decision to work. Um, another former student and I have a paper that actually looked at the labor supply effects of the federal law that started taxing Social Security benefits. And we found it actually did lead to an increase in labor supply of those high income people. It's an income effect encouraged them to work. And so, you know, it's a distortionary tax and you're, it's targeted to one demographic. So, if their labor supply elasticities are different, it could either be good or bad. You know, to the Ramsey rule of optimal taxation kind of thing. You want to tax inversely to elasticity. So, um, that's the idea here. So, in this case, there could be an effect on growth without any migration effect. So we're thinking, we emphasize primarily labor supply, but it could be other things too. Um, it could change their consumption in ways. You know, maybe their consumption savings decision is a different margin with respect to taxes, and what they consume is more beneficial for the economy or what they save or whatever their elasticity. So is there, is there some empirical evidence on the migration mechanism? Is there empirical evidence on the labor supply margin? There's a little bit. Like our paper is one, and then there was another one, and to me it is it's, it's work that needs to be done, actually. And I'm kind of surprised nobody's done it. Pervy Savak and Lucy Schmidt, Schmidt actually did a paper. Uh, but it, it, was, it was years ago. And it wasn't carefully done in the sense that um, these policies, especially if you go across states, they're really complicated and kinky. And it's not clear what their incentives are. That's why we, you know, we did one paper on just one policy, because it actually was pretty complex. But it's not something that's been studied very much. And it would be a good thing to revisit now, or especially like right around the recession where, you know, or when people had their 401ks becoming 101ks and, you know, um, a lot of people went back to work even just part time. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And I will say that is like one, we have, you know, that is one swamp I should get into. But that's at the local level. It's like, oh my God, that means I have to learn all these different laws. But no, property taxes is a big break. It's huge. There's circuit breaker, there's homesteaders. I mean, there, there's a really big break for the elderly at the local level. Uh, and that does vary. Uh, and there was a paper done a few years ago, carefully done paper on that. Um, there have been a couple papers. And, and they have found some you know, incentives. And that could lead to within state. Movement. That's kind of the other thing we've said. Well, if you're moving across states, you can pick the property tax you want. Um, you know, and so that would be more of a, of a within state. But no, you're absolutely right. That's actually probably where the biggest breaks are, I would argue. Any other? I should say one other, one other tax that's interesting in here, too, is the estate tax. It's been kind of dancing around here in the background. These same arguments you heard from all the policymakers, they've been given for the estate tax as well, except the equity argument. They haven't tried to push that one yet. But they do try to say, oh, they're going to leave if we tax their estates. And the same sort of thing where the pension exemptions have been growing, state estate taxes are falling off a cliff. Um, there's about a dozen left now. Um, whereas, you know, 40 years ago, every state had one. So, um, and the federal government ha has kind of pushed them to that with some of their policies, but that's for another day. Um, okay, so here's kind of getting into more changes the price of labor and savings, um, kind of getting at how complicated the effect on prices is. And you wouldn't think their elasticities might be different, right? They're retired, they're saving, just their station in life, their opportunity costs, their time, all these things might be different. And then there's an income effect, right? If you, just re if you forget the distortionary thing, you're redistributing income. So you're giving income to this group. Maybe if they spend, say, work differently in response to income, that could have an impact on growth. So the bottom line is they're possible. <laughs> 
and they're theoretically ambiguous. And that we believe these effects likely differ depending on the income group. And actually, this is part of another literature that I stumbled onto, um, a re recent literature that has looked at the, the effects on economic growth of taxing different income groups. So the one I'm most familiar with is Zedar. We actually are using his method. Um, we're kind of building one of our methods, builds off of his. Um, looks at the t taxes on the top 10% versus the bottom 90%, and finds that the tax breaks for the, the lower is much more stimulative than the top. And there's Piketty's got another Bizwas. They're all sort of looking at the same thing and realizing that high income is not promotion of growth the way lower income might be. So, oops, I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> Did I take it off? No, I didn't. It's an empirical question. Okay. So let's talk about the empirical analysis. Well, I'm doing well. Great, great, great. All right. So again, I mentioned that we're doing these two different analyses. So this is the one with state level data, okay? I mean, we're looking at state growth in, in every case, but this is a long panel. So we have annual state level data on the 48 contiguous states from 77 to 2015. A lot of these sort of state policy papers, especially tax, kind of leave out Alaska and Hawaii because they're just different states. I mean, Alaska's whole tax system, they get all these oil revenues. They're just, you don't want them driving your results. And Hawaii, you know, they've got their health care. They're just very different, too. Um, and people aren't moving a lot. Um, and then D.C., we just never know what to do with D.C. because <laughs> they're not really a state. Um, so it's the 48 contiguous states. We look at two measures of economic growth. I was telling Joe this, I think. When I look at this literature, there's like everybody studies a different variable. They all have different controls. It's been a little frustrating. I thought, okay, there should just be a set, you know, set model everybody does. Some use personal income, some use GDP. We said, well, we'll do both. Because they do capture really different things, right? Personal income is the well-being of who lives in the state, whereas GDP is production. That's what you're producing. So um, to me, GDP would probably be better, but you know, personal income is what they bring with them. Anyway, so we try both. We don't find a huge difference. Um, we initially started this paper by following Reed, which was a very heavily cited paper looking at the effects of taxes on economic growth. And one of the things we may revise is we, we may try to, try to trim that back just a little bit. But that was, was our starting point. And then we started adding more methods on top of it. So we took, sorry for this table, I know it's, but I'm just kind of showing you all the different things we control for. These are just our controls. We took it right from Reed. I guess just to back up, our philosophy here is that we're just going to try to pull the sort of prototypical models off the shelf that other people have used to study taxes and apply them here with this multi-approach. And so we followed Reed and took his variables so that we have, we control for the initial level of capital, labor, and grow, uh, population, which is what these growth models do. And then some human capital measures, you know, what's the education level, what's the composition of the workforce, and then what's the share of industry. So all these sort of initial conditions that you would think would be associated with growth. And then his primary interest was in the tax burden, the overall tax burden. So for us now, we want to add these tax breaks to this. And again, thinking back to the balanced budget idea, our worry was that if you have, A, if you have an income tax or you have a really hefty income tax, these breaks are probably going to be bigger because the rates are higher, you're taxing more of all income, so the breaks are going to be bigger. And if you have a really progressive tax, it's going to make the breaks go be higher for high income. So we wanted. We didn't want our measure to be picking up those things. So these, in our main model, these are the tax variables that we include. So we have the average income tax rate. That's just to capture how much does the state get from income taxes. We have the marginal, top marginal rate, to get at progressivity. And then we do include the estate tax, whether they have an estate tax or not. Because again, many of these arguments, in fact, that's the second paper I'd like to do at some point, is to really dig into that tax, because this whole argument is there as well. And the fe there's been some really interesting changes in federal policy, as you may be aware. The new law just changed it again. Um, so we wanted to control for that. Okay. 
So those are our controls, are all state level annual. So how do we measure these tax breaks? So again, if you're not familiar, especially grad students, if you're not familiar, NBR is this great tax sim calculator. It's not perfect, you know, but it's, it's a good measure of taxes. And so what we did was we went to the CPS and we created um, from the nat a nationally representative sample, we created these profiles, these households who are at different levels of the income distribution. So specifically what we did was we created bands. So we created, I think it was a five percentile band, 20th to 30th percentile, took the average that was our 25th percentile person in 1977, or household, married household, elderly household. Did the same thing in the 50th, the 75th, and the 90th. We blew off the 10th because they never pay any taxes and they're, they're really, really poor. Um, so we do this every year. So we have four different households um, in every year from 77 to 2015. We drop them into every state via this tax and calculator and see, this is simulated tax instrument, if you guys have heard of that before. Um, we calculate what their tax would be if they lived in Alabama, New York, New Jersey, and just drop them in. So again, the key here is it's only varying in state policy. That's it. It's the same people. So it's our way of only capturing policy, so no endogeneity in terms of people reacting to the policy. Right? If we looked at people who actually lived in Alabama, well, they'd be responding to the policies. This is you know, a sample being dropped in. So that's what they would actually pay if they were elderly. Then we do a little thought experiment and say, let's recalculate their liability and pretend that they're not. So we turn off the 65 plus indicator. You're no longer old and we reassign all of your Social Security benefit and retirement income to be other property income. Because we found that was the income that didn't turn on other things. <laughs> if we put on labor income, we'd get the EITC. Um, you know, we were getting bizarre things. So we wanted to not turn on something else. So that was the income that didn't, you know, trigger some other kind of strange policy. And then we use these two taxes to create our main measure. We try a few other ones too, but what we call the ETB or the elderly tax break. And it's the savings for being elderly. So we take what would you pay if you weren't elderly minus what you pay that you are, so it's positive. It's the benefit to being elderly. And then we wanted to scale it by income because we knew higher income groups were gonna get more dollars. And multiply that by 100. So the interpretation of this is it's the difference in your average tax rate if you're old, okay, right? Because tax over income would be average tax rate. So we're looking at the difference. What does this do to your average tax rate by being elderly? <laughs> we also look just at the dollar amount too, in case, you know, maybe we, we shouldn't be scaling through by income. So we, we do try it both ways. So does everybody understand the... So, 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 it's, so it's not an actual measure of what the state policy is. It's taking <laughs> uh, what income, the retirement income they have, plug into these tax. But what if that? So, 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 so your argument is that what gave what gave rise to that income level had nothing to do with a policy that exists in the state. I, I guess I'm. Okay, so it's a national sample. Yeah. Right. So we take a national sample and say you're in the national distribution here and this is what you look like. Yeah. So you have this many dollars, and we have somewhere in the paper I think, but you know, if you're in the 25th percentile you have this many dollars in social security benefits, you have this many dollars in interest, this many dollars in wages, okay? And then we drop it in, you know, ha pretend that you live in all these different states and look at your taxes. The reason why we do it that way is that, that interaction between the policies, I mean, we can't just put in like dummies. Because I put in a dummy for the pension exemption. Um, that's going to be a function of the tax rate too, right? The tax rate, you the value is going to be a function of the tax rate. And maybe it includes Social Security benefits, maybe it doesn't. I mean, it, it's, we've played around. It's hard to put the actual policy parameters in there. And so this is a summary measure of all of the features of the system and predicting what your tax bill would be. Sure. So I mean, I guess I, guess I understand what you're trying to do. Have you, have, have you tried to sort of look at uh, just indicators of, 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 of 
you know, you can sort of crudely measured sort of change, like the, a pension uh, exemption expansion you know, we, and sort of looking at that. We did in an early draft. Uh, I'm trying to remember what we found. Um, I think it was similar, but you know, that's a good point. It certainly would be a nice robustness check to make sure that at least the pension exemption, because that's yeah, the that's big, the that's the big kahuna, and we could probably, you know, multiply it times the marginal tax rate you'd like be likely to face or something. That's the only thing I worry about is, you know, you have a eighty thousand dollar pension exemption, but the marginal tax rate's two percent. Well, that's a, that's a policy heterogeneity yeah. story across these. How many states that did it over your time period? Uh, oh, they're been a, they they a they, okay. they they adjust a lot. And they adjust around the margins too. You know, they have these income phase outs and they adjust along those margins too. But you know, that's not a, a bad idea. Gosh, it would be it would be not. It's more how do you how do you not do it with fifteen variables? That's been my concern. Right. Is okay, if there were particular I mean there's also the possibility of doing like particular particular case studies of state, you know, synthetic kind of control mm. design with particular states that have, you know, particular pol policy shocks that you think are really interesting to look at. I think we do. We actually have a couple, but it's using this measure. But you're right. We could do something like that. Yeah. So particular, yeah, like a synthetic, yeah. One more method out of this paper. <laughs> Yeah, no, just to sort of pull, I mean, for those of us who, you know, for, for, for those who might be skeptical of the, in seeing what you're trying to do and create sort of some kind of index type measure that brings together all the all the parameters in some sense. That you want but, right, like look, at, like look at Georgia when they increase it's, it's, their pension exemption a whole bunch. Yeah, exactly. And so see whether. Wanted, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, no, and we actually, we're already kind of halfway there because we have a few event right, right. history graphs and we could certainly, um, we could certainly do that. And maybe, yeah, the synthetic control would be, we could add one more method. <laughs> I'm confused. Isn't that ETB driven by differences in the state treatment of uh, commonly taxes? Yes. Is that by state? Yes, exactly. That's what this, it's, it's designed to be a summary measure of how favorably the state treats the elderly versus an equivalent non-elderly household. So it's only the policy. We, we hold the people constant. So you use the MBER tax sim? Yes. Uh, plug in state policy? They have state in there. We don't even have, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a great they little thing. The, they have all the state bells and whistles? They do, yeah. So I don't see why you would be concerned about anything else. That, that is the right measure. It's a, su it's a, it's a su summary it's a, measure. It's a, it's, a sum it's a summary measure. I, I, I guess it's an issue if you think. <sighs> if you think that people are looking at, I, I think yeah. I could, if they're only looking at pension exemption, I mean, that's always been my argument. Maybe they aren't sophisticated enough to know all these nuances and they are only attracted by, hey, they. Well, but you're not, now you're, you're acting as if it's migration. It's your, no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right, you're right. But it would be an argument for maybe trying more than one. If is it migration, is it distortionary? But yeah, and I don't think it is migration. But no, that that's a that's a good point. Actually I gotta jot all this stuff down because I'll never remember. It's really very hard to imagine that these very minor tax breaks are going to affect the behavior of elderly people whose labor supply elasticities are probably very low and whose entrepreneurial tendencies are probably very small. Right. Although I, I did I, learn that on, on its face, uh, it's sort of hard to believe that this is going to have any significant effect on growth. I was with you. <laughs> To be honest, this was actually telling the students earlier this morning. This was a paper I set out thinking we're not going to find an effect, but we can sell it because, or you know, it matters because other people believe there is an effect. Well, There's politicians. politicians do. You're right. You know, they don't cite my migration. They never talk about migration stuff either. So I don't know why we convince them now. But, but I do think um, there are income effects, right? And if they're spending or, and actually the elderly I learned are disproportionately self-employed. Those who do work, they oftentimes are self-employed and that's supposed to be the engine for entrepreneurship. And so that's, but I, I'm kind of with you. I'm you're, you know, I'm not arguing. I wasn't expecting, and I'm a little concerned by the size of the effects we find. I'll be totally honest. I think our effects are but too big. This wouldn't affect the return to entrepreneurship. Well, they would, 
right, because in some cases... The labor income is not going to be changed. By the in income. some states it is. Um, in some states it is. I know like in Georgia it is. Um, and it might give you more disposable income to where you can take those risks to, you know, try it entrepreneurial. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, it's, I, you know, I understand your, and this is what we have run into, and it's like, well, and that's why I love the Yancey's quote. He actually tries to talk about where it's going to matter, although, whether I believe him. But, you know, that, that's the, the mechanisms that we think might be an option. But I agree, the numbers are, are small, although, yeah, let me actually, oh, I'm sorry, this didn't show up very well. Here actually is what the ETB looks like. Darn those statographs. Um, so I'll just try to explain. They're all about 2%, which sounds really small, except that actually average state income tax rates are small. So this is about half. Half, um, it's about half the rate. So in other words, the benefit's about 2%. And the average, um, I can't remember if it's the non-elderly, the elderly pays for, you know, something like that. So it's a sizable proportion of what you pay to the state, which, you know, I talked about on the first slide. These are sizable proportional changes. So it's about 2% 2, about 2 of your income, which is not, you know, not nothing. It's, it's something. And it's pretty much stable across the, the different groups. It's about 2% for all of them. And you can see sort of bumps, you see big bumps. Um, with um, the Tax Reform Act, and you can't, oh, dog, you really can't see the, me the median one very well. And you can see the impacts of some of the federal laws. But this, so it's, it's the green line you can barely see is the mean and the max and min over the years. So, you know, it hasn't, they haven't gone off the charts the way you might think, although there's been sort of, a, of an increase. But there have been other things going on as well. Um, just to give you an idea of the states, um, this is the 50th in 77, the 50th in 2015, and then this is the change. And, and I, I was like, after I concluded California was middle of the road, I looked at this map and I'm like, yeah, California is middle of the road. You know, it's right in that orange category between red and yellow. So, um, you know, went from light yellow to bright yellow, but it's kind of middle or orange, but it, it's pretty middle of the road, um, at least at the 50th. And so I've got more maps. Now to your point, Joe, so I was a little skeptical of this tax and measure too. This will also hit your point. You'll agree, you'll, this will give you fuel for your point. Um, I said, let's, let's find some policy breaks and see if our measure captures it. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'll show you just a couple, because I only have 15 minutes left. Um, so I'll, I'll do Indiana. Um, so this is a refundable credit that increases from $50 to $90. You know, we're talking small change. It's 1982, still small, small change. Um, and so what we would expect to see, and I'm really sorry, these just, can you guys see them better than I can? No, not really, sorry about that. I don't know why these are coming out so faded. Um, so the blue is the 25th, which is where we'd expect to see the big jump, right? Because 40 bucks is a lot more to somebody in the bottom 25th percentile as a fraction of their income than somebody. And so here you can barely see it, but it barely bumps the high income person. So this is a, a policy that actually did help the low income. And you can see it, because that blue line is the low income. So it did what it was supposed to do. It didn't affect the other ones as much. And then we plotted over here the growth. So the blue line is Indiana's growth, and the red is the national. So we tried to see, do we see this big change? And I would argue, I mean, you can look at it real hard and maybe try to argue with me, but I don't see anything. It seems like it's kind of just, I don't see any big bump. I mean, there was one big bump, but then it went down farther, and you know, so it's maybe a one-time shock. You want to call that a one-time shock, but um, so that was one. Um, I've got a couple other here, but I won't go through all of them. Um, this one, I guess, I will show you because this is an age exemption decreasing, and so that's going to hurt high income more. Because when you get a $730 exemption, that lowers your taxable income. If you're at the top rate, that's going to be worth more to you. And it's not going to affect the low income hardly at all, because they're hardly paying anything. And that's exactly what we see. Again, you can't really see the lines, but the high income drop a whole lot. The low income drop less. And again, I don't see any discern discernible increase on growth. It all just kind of looks the same. So I'll click through the rest. There's Kentucky. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. We, we do this a couple of different ways. There's this five-year interval thing that Reed did, which is how we started. 
where you basically, these growth models, you, you want to see what happens over a five year period so you actually see the growth. So you carve up your data into these intervals and you, you regress what happened over five years on the starting values. They also include the changes in variables, which bothers me, and we played, you know, tried to look at that for robustness, but again, that's what the literature does. So that's one, and we include state and year fixed effects. So I'll just show you quickly here. So this is the 25th percentile, 50th, 75th, and 90th. The L is the level, starting period, so that would be the long run growth effect. That's how these models work. The D is the change during five years, and that's supposed to be capturing the short run transitory effects. And so you can see the low income, it kind of peters off. They're negative, most of the action with the, with the low income, which again, you know, really surprises. It's not what I expected to find. Maybe that's part of why I kept going to these different methods. I kept thinking I'd find something different. Um, we do a whole bunch of robustness checks. You know, we drop labor capital, we drop all the income tax stuff, we do dollars. And this one I think is really, so there I'm showing how robust it is. This one I find really interesting because this is the dollar amount of savings. And look at what happens to that coefficient. So it, it does suggest that our dividing through by income makes sense, that a dollar is having a smaller and smaller effect the richer you are, which to me makes sense. Um, the second approach is time series, error correction model, which um, I have been trying to learn a little bit, but I'm still not the strongest person, but this is a lot of what's going on now. So you basically use an error correction model, you have these distributed lags, essentially you use a dynamic fixed effect estimator, that, I, that I'm firmly um, in control of. But the advantage of this is it's annual data, you get a lot more observations. Um, and you're using time series properties. And again, the results are quite similar. You see the, the negative for the, for the lowest income, not much. In general, it's more positive. Their numbers are smaller because it's a one-year change now instead of a five-year change. That's one change I think we're going to make the papers, try to make everything annualized so they're more comparable. Um, but um, it again tells us the same thing. And again, it's still robust. You know, we do all the same checks, it's robust. So summing this up, um, we find in this analysis that tax breaks for the low income elderly decrease growth, higher income really doesn't do much, it's negative if anything, and it's robust to a whole bunch of stuff. So let me quickly talk about the federal because I think this is kind of interesting. So the ZDAR paper we modeled off of was lucky because all he was interested was everybody, 90, you know, 10 and 90. We had to focus on policies that would affect the elderly. Um, and so we look through the same set of the Romer policies that are viewed as exogenous. And we found two in our sample that we could get data for. Um, one was the 1993 policy that began taxing Social Security benefits. Clearly that's going to impact the high income people. Now they're going to have to pay a higher tax. Um, Another one was um, Bush's EGTRA um, bill in 2001, which indirectly affected the elderly by lowering the tax rates on um, the low income um, people. So it actually, that it's hard to get the low income elderly because they just don't pay many taxes. Again, in my opinion, this is a different but not necessarily better source of variation. Now the variation, everyone's facing the same policy, but the states are affected differently because they have more or less people who are benefiting from the policy. So that's, so it's completely, it's completely different, no, completely different. Um, we thought, so we thought was a good compliment. So again, these are the two policies we chose. I forgot I had this here. Um, now we had to go a different route because we can't use the CPS any longer. It's too small at the state level. So we went to census data because we wanted to get a measure of how the whole population in the state was affected by these policies. So we went to the 1990 and 2000 census and we calculated their federal tax liability, again using um, TaxSim, and we did it for every household because we wanted to get the general effect of the law, right? If the law was a tax break, we needed to model that too. And then we went back and we calculated the tax savings for being elderly. So we did that for every household in the census. Then we summed that over, the, each of these measures we summed over all the households in the state. 
to get kind of, here's the oomph, here's the bag of money the state got because of the federal policy. Here's the money that got taken away because of the federal policy at that state level. Okay, does that make sense? So this is all about the different people. Policy's all the same. So again, it's a totally different approach. Okay, and again, we're not the first ones to come up with this. There's Zidar and um, Biswas and another one too. So again, it's a very different source of variation. Um, we also confirm these policies have their expected effects. I'll just show you one of them. This is the tax of 1993. So the blue line is the tax savings before the law changed. This is by decile. So this is low income elderly going up to high income elderly. The red line is what happened to it after the law. So it behaved just the way we would have expected. It took away, you know, lowered the tax savings to being a rich elderly person, which is what we would expect. And the same thing for EGTRA. We found that the benefits for it were more in the moderate to low income. So the way these models work, I don't know why these are so faint. I should have made them bold or something. Um, so the way these models, again, we, this is another model we just took off the shelf. We just followed um, Nakamura and Stenson and Zidar um, and just kind of took their model right off the shelf. So they look at the level of you know, income or GDP before, they look at the level after, they basically take the two year proportional change. And then they do the same thing, oops, they do the same thing with you know, the variable of interest. So we include just two variables, one is the total impact on savings, so it's a really sharp look, it's not a long run effect, it's a sharp, sharp what happened the next year. So again, it's a different empirical approach too. Um, so we looked at um, what was the total tax savings to every, to, for the elderly, what was the change in the overall liability for the whole population because we wanted to control for that. And this is the final model. So we have a state fixed effect. We only have two, two points, but we can do a state fixed effect. And we have a year dummy. We actually try it without, and it's even stronger without. And then we have the, the two-year changes in those variables. So again, this is, you know, there are only two policy changes. So we have two, you know, two experiments we pool together. And I got to tell can we turn off the camera? No, I got to tell you, when we did this, I'm like, I'm just sure this isn't going to work. I just, you know, I couldn't believe it was actually the same set of results. And, you know, we've made enough mistakes along the way. For, okay, the wind will blow and they'll go away. Um, and no, we kind of, oh, we screwed up here, we screwed, they just, they have stood up. So once again, I need to work better to make these comparable because they're very different measures. That other one's a percentage, this is a percent of GDP. So a one unit change in GDP is a huge, you know, a, a huge change. Um, but anyway, it's the same pattern that the benefits accruing to the bottom 25th of the elderly have the most negative and then it just sort of dies off from there. And again, we do it both with GDP and with personal income. So again, there's something going on there. And um, we're now trying to work at sort of looking at the mechanisms. Are we seeing effects on employment? Are we seeing effects on population? I'm trying to tear it apart. Oh, actually, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So yeah, that, was, that was my question. Is there is, did, about the mechanisms for those effects at the lower end of the district? Where, Do you have any sort of initial <laughs> insights about what's I don't. I mean, I would have thought it was probably through through labor supply, and I say I'm still, you know, I'm skeptical to be honest. I'm, you know, it just it keeps it keeps coming up. There's something going on, and so I I think maybe it's labor supply, or I don't know if it's the fact there's such big effects with the federal makes me wonder if it is a demand side, mm -hmm. you know, stimulus, and they're not. I don't know. The low income aren't spending their income the, the way other people would, or. I actually do have one. Um, let me get to the slide because there is. Well, I do have one other theory. So just to sum up quickly, we ruled out equity, right? Past work. I'll get to in just a second. Um, so we think it might be growth. So uh, where did oh I want to? Here we go. This is one thing I'm realizing, and this is what we're working on right now, and we're getting some kind of puzzling results. I'm still trying to figure out if we're doing things right. Um, you know, this is a differential. Right? So just like that last exercise showed you, the benefits to the elderly fell because we granted some breaks to low-income non-elderly. So saying that tax breaks for the low-income elderly is bad for growth may also instead be saying that we ought to be targeting tax breaks 
to the non-elderly low income. Do you see what I'm saying? So those low income non-elderly are encouraged to work, are encouraged to, to do what have you. So that's the best mechanism, and that's what the labor supply mechanism I'm thinking of. Um, and we're trying to look at that, um, and again, that's our, quite honestly, our challenge here is the paper's already so big, we're trying to figure out how to make it more manageable. I was sharing with Joe, I think we, we've worn out everybody who reads it. Sorry for that. We tried to trim it down. I know it's still kind of long and dense, but you ha I'm sorry, you've been waiting patiently. Sorry. I'm just puzzled here looking at table six. It looks like the coefficient is many times the same as there. Um, the results are. I think they're T-stats, T-stats are in parentheses. Yeah, it's, it's the T-statistics. They should be T-statistics. No, T-stats yeah. yeah. So yeah, the standard errors are large, which I'm actually, <laughs> in this case, I'm kind of glad, because again, you know, little side tail, little ends, of course, it's not, I don't feel like anything's inside when it's, <laughs> you'll, you'll edit some of this, no. Um, I do feel like our effects are large. Um, I think I even have that on here. Um, let's see, so it could be blah, blah, blah. I will point out, this isn't where the policy action is. I, there's sort of two takeaways I would take from this. One is, we find some admittedly puzzling results that low income tax breaks have a real effect. And we need to figure out what's going on there. The other end, I was right, in that tax breaks for the high income elderly don't seem to be doing anything. And that's where all the action is. That's where all the states are trying to do this. So that one I feel better about. I'm still a little confused by what's going on at the low income because you're talking about small dollar amounts and, um, you know, so that's, that's where I still am. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I was wondering, what are, especially the census data, so they're excluding anyone who's like in an institutionalized setting, right? So all these sort of retirement right. homes. And, so I'm wondering like where that could be playing. I mean, oh, that's interesting. Hmm. see if your results suggest maybe it's not playing in. Like, I don't know if it's CPS. Um, well, and again, it's not the people, you know, so it wouldn't matter. It would just be the policy there. But that's a really good question about the institutional population. Um, yeah. And how would these things play in there. I mean, I think there would be two groups, probably a lot of them aren't paying any tax if they're on Medicaid and they're, you know, they've lost all their assets. But on the other side, there might be some significant, you know, for the, the richer ones. Are they qualifying an actual institutionalized setting, right? Are they in the retirement community or are they actually in the hospital? Right. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. We've always kind of just ignored the institutional, you know, the prisoners, the nursing home, and it is tough with elderly sometimes to, to ignore that. But that's, a, yeah, I, I really don't know. And that could affect the federal one. The first one, you know, wouldn't. But no, that's a good question. Is there any other? Let me see if there's, I still have more probably, or should we call it? I think that's, okay, that sounds good. So again, anything you think of later, middle of the night, you know, shoot me an email. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks you guys so have been great. Care.